This is Binod Shankar and you're listening to the Real Finance Mentor podcast from the realfinancementor.com. The Real Finance Mentor is your go-to resource for insight and inspiration on careers in finance, CFA and more. I would think why this podcast? Well, my goal is to deliver insight and inspiration for your finance career by making it one relatable. This is not theoretical stuff. We zero in on the critical practical issues. Number 2, authentic. No bullshit, no side stepping. The topics, guests and questions are all from that perspective. And number 3, take a chartered accountant and CFA charter holder, add 17 plus years as a corporate warrior, mix in 10 years of entrepreneurship, throw in a decade of full-time CFA training, add speaking, mentoring, cycling and mountaineering, and that's me. Welcome to the real finance mentor, or as I call it, RFM. My guest today is uh, Saida Zainab Gardezi, uh, who is a CFA charter holder. Now, I've known uh, Saida for quite some time now, and she comes to a very interesting background. After finishing her degree uh, from American University in Sharjah, she spent about five, six years in accounting. But that's not the interesting part. She moved to the US and where she is right now in Dallas. Uh, at about 11 and a half hours away from where I'm recording right now, where she's uh, working as a portfolio manager and in Argent Financial Group, which is one of the leading um, independent fiduciary wealth managers in, in the US, managing an AUM of approximately 35 billion US dollars. Um, Saida actually uh, handles multi-asset portfolios for individuals, family offices, institutions, and she gets involved in very interesting things like um, asset allocation, research, rebalancing, so on and so forth. Now, now, the reason why I have her here is because uh, her journey is one of uh, self-awareness, discovery, transformation, and career success, among other things. Today, we're going to explore all that. We're also going to explore things like uh, what you do in college, uh, what you learn, or what not to do, what to do. Uh, the power of soft skills and networking, very important. How to deal with depression? How do people see depression? And of course, um, career tips for anyone aspiring to be in finance. So very warm welcome to the show, Saida. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. Very happy to be here. Now, tell us a bit about your earlier years, including parents and parenting, schooling and the religious and cultural environment. This um, so-called backstory could help the listeners understand you and the questions and answers that follow uh, much better. <coughs> okay, so um, I was born in Pakistan um, both of my parents and my parents' families, you know, are of are from Pakistan. So I, you know, grew up there and um, really hadn't, you know, explored much of the world or hadn't gone anywhere apart from, you know, just being in Pakistan. And maybe I had visited Dubai once uh, to come see my uncle. Um, and that would have been when I was maybe 10 or 9. So other than that, I really had, apart from just seeing what I saw on TV, I had no real exposure to what was life or world outside of, you know, being in Pakistan and outside of my own family, cultural, um, you know, societal bubble. And uh, it was when I was 12 or 13 and my dad, he got a job in Dubai. And really that was the biggest, the biggest change uh, I would say in my life. Um, and that really shaped me and changed me as a person um, in a time or at an age that is very impressionable and a very important age uh, in your life. So yes, so that was when we moved to Dubai. Um, and then, you know, things started changing from there and going from there. But talking about family, um, both my parents, I, would, I wouldn't say my parents were very progressive or what we call progressive now. Um, I think my parents were a good mix of both. You know, they had, they were close to the cultural roots and we all know how you know South Asian culture is uh, very much. Um, it is a bit patriarchal, and also you know some families are more patriarchal than others. But on the whole, the culture is patriarchal. Um, and then um, you know both of my parents they had 
they put immense pressure and immense uh, importance on education, um, you know, which we don't see in all of the families, especially for, you know, when, it, when we talk about education for women. Um, so both of my parents, you know, that was, that was a very, I would say, um, huge kudos to them that coming from, you know, a time that they came from and whatever they saw in the society, still they, there was never any discrimination between, I have two brothers and one sister. So there was never any discrimination in terms of education for me and my sister and my brothers. So we always had that, you know, good solid base that education is important. Um, and even growing up, you know, I've, I heard my dad, you know, say to me and my sister that when you guys grow up, make sure you're working and make sure you're making your own money. Um, and, you know, growing up, that was something very um, normal that we heard from my dad. So, you know, it was only after I grew up and I started talking to my friends and, you know, we started discussing how our childhoods were and what our parents used to say. And other dads wouldn't say stuff like that. So my dad would always say, you know, earn your own money, uh, never be dependent on anybody else's money, whether it's your husband or whoever. Just make sure that you're financially secure, that you can make your own decisions um, and not be, you know, not be, um, not have your decisions kind of based on, you know, the fact that you may be financially dependent on someone else. So it limits some of your options. Um, so, yes. So, you know, um, they had both of my parents had some feminist traits in that regard. Um, but then also there was a cultural side to them, you know, um, or at least to their families. So growing up, um, being a woman uh, or being a young impressionable girl, you know, I would hear stuff like, and if not directly from my parents, but at least, you know, the people around me, whether it was friends or friends, parents or whoever. So just the society at large, you know, so growing up, you would hear stuff like, um, the importance of marriage and how marriage is so integral to, you know, a woman and how women should get married at the right age and the right age being, you know, in, in the early twenties um, and how, if a woman does not get married at the right age, then, you know, she may never get married. And if she does not get married, then that somehow impacts her status in society uh, or diminishes her status in society. Um, and then also, you know, like a woman should get educated, but not too educated, or she should not be more educated than her husband. So, you know, these, uh, I would call it toxic, you know, uh, these are, this is stuff that you should not, a girl should not be hearing. Um, so I was glad that, you know, my parents were there to kind of balance or to kind of offset some of this um, verbiage or some of this, you know, very normal conversations that you would hear um, in the society, in school, wherever. Yeah, I mean, uh, I always say, you know, you are a product of two things, right? Upbringing and genetics. And I yes. always see this very strong correlation between the way children are raised, um, whether conservative or open-minded or parochial, or patriarchal and how they turn out later in life. And I've observed that a lot among my, my uh, former students and mentees. So I, I have no doubt that how you were raised and your sisters were raised had a huge influence on how you have turned out now. And, and we'll dig into that later in the podcast, but a fascinating uh, story nevertheless. So let's uh, fast forward to you being in college, right? I mean, you graduated with a finance degree from the AUS in the UAE. Uh, yet your first few jobs were in accounting and not finance, despite the fact that AUS had and still has probably the best finance department faculty in the UAE. Why did you then choose a job in accounting and not finance? Um, okay, so I will say that when I started AUS, I was a very different person uh, than I am now. Um, I was a good student. I had good grades, um, but I wasn't really sure about what I wanted my career path to look like. So I started at AUS with a marketing um, concentration or my major was marketing. 
And then I would say that it was only in towards the end of the second year or towards the third year that I changed it to finance. And that's when, you know, I knew that I wanted to do something in finance, but I wasn't really sure, you know, whether it was investment management or being a financial analyst or being working in corporate finance, you know, versus wealth management. I, I did not know much about all of this. So I did not know, I guess, the practical side of getting a degree in finance and what that would look like. Um, also, I would say that I was book smart, you know, and I was not really what they call street smart. So, um, okay, that's one point. And then the other one I would say was, I also had a bit of an entitled attitude, you know, which maybe at that point I was too egoistic to even admit and talk about it. But now, you know, I know. Um, and I'll start with the second point. And, you know, with that, AUS is, uh, at least it was, and probably it still is, one of the best universities in, in the region. So, you know, when I got my admission in AUS, you know, I kind of thought, you know, I've made it, that who else are they going to hire? You know, so when I, when I graduate, probably companies are going to be lining up to hire me because they may not want to hire, you know, some other gal or guy from a smaller or less known university in the region. So that's that's an entitlement attitude. And there's an issue with that. You know, it's it kind of you can't see your blind spots with that kind of attitude. So I would say that was one reason. And then, you know, not really having the practical knowledge or the practical experience. Like I had my cousins and you know other folks that I had known that were not studying in AUS or they were studying in other universities like Canadian University of Dubai or some some of the other ones. And they would be, you know, out there working, whether it was summer break when they were in 12th grade or it was, you know, summer break during the first year of college, they would work at, you know, any kind of event that's happening in Dubai or just, just being out there, networking, talking to people, getting to know the folks in the community. And I was not doing any of that. Um, you know, the only thing I did was an internship in my third year. And at that point, um, you know, it was 2008. I just got whatever, like some of the, I got maybe the best thing that was offered to me. And at that point it was helping support the accounts department as an intern of, you know, one of the quasi government uh, companies in Dubai. So I did not get a finance internship. Um, and then also when I started working, it was 2009, September. So the recession had just happened. There were fewer jobs. Uh, there were very few finance jobs. And even the ones that were there needed experience. Uh, and the ones that did not need experience, there were like so many other people applying for the same job. I remember that I went for an interview at PNG as a finance analyst, and there were maybe 30 other candidates there, you know, and everybody was, you know, like really phenomenal. So it was one position, but they had shortlisted 30 kids that were really good. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I and I did not have the luxury to wait for a job offer and, you know, just to see, you know, start applying just to start applying and then wait for to get something. Um, so I graduated. May, June of 2009, and I started working in August, uh, so I really needed to, you know, start earning and get out there and, you know, there were more accounting jobs than finance jobs. So that coupled with not really having a very um, clear career path, or at least in my head, knowing what I want my career to look like, all of that coupled with having really no work experience apart from just one internship, you know, it landed me um, uh, in an accounting job, not by choice, but mm. as a consequence of circumstances. And my own lack of preparedness, you know, I wouldn't blame circumstances. <laughs> Oh, interesting. It, it's yeah. Your situation was a combination of this bad timing, you know, got the global financial crisis and eight, nine, ten, and and of course, like you said, lack of professional clarity on your end, right? Which, um, in retrospect, would have yes, probably that was the biggest, I would say, factor. Probably in retrospect, made would have made you focus on the right areas, but lesson learned. Uh, 
Let's fast forward to, uh, of course, the, the, the postgraduate part, which is the CFA uh, qualification, right? the CFA charter. Now, we had this chat some time ago, and you said that the idea to start the CFA journey came later to you, right? After graduation and after working in accounting for a while. So tell me about what motivated you to start the CFA journey or who? Yes. So after I started working, um, I mean, I really did not want to work in accounts, uh, but I was working because I got the job. I needed whatever money I was getting. And then it just so happened that even the other subsequent two jobs that I did were also in accounts. Uh, so when it was my second job, you know, that's when I was really at my end. And I was thinking that I need to I cannot have my career, you know, progress in this way where I'm not happy with the work I'm doing. You know, there are people who are passionate and want to be accountants, but that's not me. Um, so, you know, I knew that something had to change because with my experience and with my background, I'm still getting accounting job offers, uh, or at least that's the ones that for, those are the ones that I get call back from. So um, really my initial plan after graduation or after doing my undergraduate was that I'll work for a few years and then I'll go to, you know, Canada. That's kind of like how the way kids are, right? Like I'll go to Canada for an MBA um, and then maybe I'll stay there or come back. I don't know. Um, but that did not work out. You know, there was monetary issues and uh, because the jobs that I got were not really very, very high paying jobs it was really between like 4000 a month to 7000 a month like varied between those so that's not enough to live and then also save um so you know i did my gmat got my admission letter everything happened but it's just like i never had the funds that you would need to move countries and to go live in a new place and you know start that so however you know that unfolded and then um uh and then i was kind of bummed out you know for a few months but then I was thinking, okay, what's, uh, what's, you know, what can I do now? Um, and then at that point, my, um, my boss, he was a CFA charter holder or my boss's boss, you know, he was a CFA charter holder and he was the head of investments at the insurance company that I was working on. So I saw, you know, what he would be doing. And I thought, you know, that's, uh, so that was mostly corporate finance. And I thought, you know, like that's, that's interesting. He looks at, you know, more of the planning and analysis um, what's going to be the return on investment, all of that stuff. So at least looking at him and observing him, I thought, okay, if this is what a finance degree or what, you know, being a CFA charter holder entails, then I want to do that. You know, I want, I want my career path to look something like his. Mm -hmm. um, and then a little um, rewind from there. So my, one of my professors at AUS um, Dr. Zuhair Jarkas, he, he's, uh, he works at Mubadla Investments now, but he used to be a finance professor um, back when I, it was probably 2006, 2007, uh, when I took his course. And he was a huge, huge CFA proponent. Like he would tell all of his finance students that at least, at least attempt level one and then see, you know, what you want to do, because you may like the material you read, you know, you, it's going to open up a lot of doors. So give it a try. So, you know, that, um, I mean, I was quite driven during that class, but then after that class, I never really thought about CFA. I just thought about, you know, doing an MBA and just that that's what I was going to do. But it kind of stuck in my mind. Like it was there at the back of my mind. And then now working at this insurance company and my boss's boss, who was a charter holder, you know, it kind of like, it was probably the extra push that I needed. And I, I thought, you know, the MBA stuff is not working out. I cannot just keep sulking about it or just keep continuing in the current career path that I am. I Something has to change. Mm. And that's when, you know, I took the leap and I decided that, you know, I, I will start the CFA journey. I have it in me. I know what I want my career path to look like, or at least I have a better idea now. Um, so that's when I registered for level one um, and, I would say in hindsight, you know, the Canada thing not working out really gave me the push. Mm. And it was, it was like, I have no other option, but to, you know, do all of my exams and become a CFA charter holder. So I was, I mean, extremely, extremely driven to the point of, you know, 
they say like driven people are sometimes crazy, right? So I was driven to the point of craziness, mm. but in a positive way, you know, not like in a creepy way. <laughs> got it. Got it. Yeah, that's quite fascinating uh, because of how a role model at work influenced you to take up this stuff uh, program. Yeah, you know, and I was thinking like if I did not, if he was not a CFA charter holder, I don't know. I'm I may or maybe my CFA journey would have been delayed a few more years. Um, so yeah, it helps hmm. having those role models for sure. Now, of course, when you talk about the CFA program, uh, every man and his uncle and dog would automatically and immediately say, it's tough, it's vast, it's complex, failure rates are high. So since you've been through the program, and I'm sure lots of my listeners are currently uh, candidates and going through the program, what are three key hacks that you employed to crack the CFA exams? Okay, so um, I will say that first, know why you want to do it. Um, it should not be something that you're doing because it looks nice, it looks good on a CV, or it's just in the certification you need. I mean, that's not you, you may be able to do it then, but I would say that just from my own experience and from what little I know, I would say that that's not a good enough reason uh, to do the, to become a CFA charter holder. So having that purpose in mind and having a clear vision in mind gives you the drive and it keeps you going even on days where it becomes too much and, you know, you're just like drained and, maybe low energy or something it just gives you that mental focus and the drive to con to start with the program to continue it and to like take it to completion so just having that clear picture in mind is very important why you want to do it and um you know what value is it going to add to your life or to your career path uh coming to the hacks um i will say that starting early so, you know, I know there are some folks that study for three months and they can pass level one and then they can pass level two. But what worked for me is I'm more consistent and, you know, I, I would rather, I need more time to, to prepare and to get all the study done. So, and with the immense amount of material that you have to study for all of the CFA exams and to really study it right. You know, I mean, it's not just about going through the Schweizer books or going through some of the, whatever the revision prep is. It's good to go through even the curriculum books and to really, really understand and to enjoy and to learn the concepts. It's not about passing an exam. It's about knowing the material and that takes time. So I would say starting early, and at least at least five to six months before the exam, you know, at least start opening the books and reading it and doing all of that. So yes, starting early um, is was one hack. I got professional classes for all of my levels and that was very helpful for me. Uh, some people like to study at their own pace, but for me uh, having those classes, um, it gave me, it gave me more structure. Uh, it kept me on track and it also gave me a good community of other students that were going through the same journey. So, you know, it didn't feel like I was alone. Um, so yes, having the, those, and you know, it got me um, connected to people like you and, you know, so that's good. <laughs> um, also uh, over-prepare, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's also very important. You know, they say that you have to study 300 hours for an exam. I mean, all of those are just averages, but I think I put in maybe 600 hours or more for every exam. And, you know, even the other folks that I've talked to that have cleared um, at least level one and level two and probably their first attempt, you know, everyone says that just study whatever time you get. Um, and also, you know, over preparing kind of helps you just um, calm the nerves some and then really helps you um, you know, whatever possible questions can come your way, you're probably prepared for any of those. So, so yes, I would say that not focusing on, you know, that I only need to study 300 hours or how many ever hours, just like study as much as you can um, because you would rather over prepare and then pass 
then, you know, because I know people who have failed and they were probably like, you know, just very close to the passing rate. And that, I mean, it, it hurts. So better over prepare and pass rather than, you know, being a little under the passing rate. Um, and then also for me, um, you know, social life, I put a hard limit or a hard stop. And that was a bit aggressive, you know, not everybody needs to do that, but that worked for me. Um, and also, you know, I was of the mindset that I have to do this, you know, there is no other option. I want my career path to change. And that is the most, most important thing right now. All social events, all weddings, you know, I can make up for it in a year, in three years, I don't know, whenever. Um, so yes, you know, just knowing your priorities and knowing, you know, which social events you can just let go. And yes, if it's your sister's wedding, you may want to go for that, but anything else can, can wait and it's okay. Um, so, and for from my side, I even told my close friends and my family that, you know, this exam or these exams are very, very important for me. So understand if I tell you that I cannot come out now or I cannot come see you or, you know, living in Dubai, something is always happening. Somebody is always visiting. There is always, always something happening. So, you know, I understand the plight of all the students and all the folks that are in Dubai and it's it's not easy. Um, but if not, if not totally, you know, pause your social life, at least limit it. Uh, Cause that's, that's very important. The CFA exam and the, the material is your number one priority. I will caveat that, you know, now that I'm married and I have a kid, um, I'm talking about folks who are single, you know, I don't know. Um, and, you know, people who are married and who have other responsibilities and who have multiple kids or one kid, you know, their journey may look like something else. Um, they may not need six months, they may need eight months because they can only, you know, do so much studying in a day. So that differs. But for folks that are single that, you know, are maybe married, but don't have kids, you know, there's no excuse, just get it done with you know the time you get and all of that yeah yeah so that is also quite useful uh, especially given the fact that people have various i mean they have to juggle family work and study so it's a bit elastic yeah. how much time you require um now of yeah. course i'm not finished talking about uh, cfa exam hacks because Although you passed level one and two in first attempts, you stumbled in level three, which is not as uncommon as it sounds, because I think level three is the most underestimated and yet the most different in terms of scope and curriculum and format compared to the two earlier levels. And hence people uh, underestimate the exam and, and the failure mm -hmm. results. But tell us what exactly happened in your case and why. So, you know, level one and level two, I passed in the first attempt. Level two, I was actually surprised because even the night before the exam, I was thinking, oh my God, I don't know this. Like I was panicking and, you know, I was, I had studied everything, done all the practice, everything, but I was still thinking that there is so much I don't know. So level two, luckily, or through preparedness and all of that, I passed in the first attempt. So after I passed level two, you know, there was a sigh of relief and I was like, you know, okay, good. Okay, I'm, uh, there's something good about me or there's something like, I started to like become overconfident and also started to think that I am probably smart enough to, you know, pass all of these three levels that people say are so difficult, but I passed my first attempt. So some ego started to kick in. Um, we all have ego, but you know, sometimes it starts to, surface and then we have to kind of like you know tame it down a little bit um but I maybe fed my ego and I was thinking okay you know I'm done with two-thirds of the journey it's just one exam that is left and people say the second level is the hardest one so if I've done that then I can you know I don't need to study for six months for level three um so you know there was some of that ego self-confidence overconfidence not self-confidence overconfidence um also you know, when I thought about this question, or when I think about this question, I think there was also some level of exhaustion that was there, where I did need a break. Because I had limited my social life, you know, the CFA exam was 
the center of my life for these two plus years. Um, so at some level, I did need a break. And I did not recognize that, you know, I just like kept on going. And um, so even when I started my classes, and even when I started, you know, reading the books, I was not as um, I was not as driven, as committed as I was in level one and two, where in level one and two, I would study before class, I would study after class. Uh, there was nothing that could like if I if I had probably usually during the weekdays, I would have three hours allotted to studying. And there was nothing that can come in between that, like not, n totally nothing at all. And level three, you know, some days I would study, some days I would go out with my friends. So I started to, I think I was missing my social life as well. So I started to relax a bit, became overconfident, you know, went out meeting my friends, doing all of that. And I think, um, also, on a more deeper level, I was a bit satisfied with myself. And I was thinking that, you know, I set a goal for myself and I'm almost there. So, you know, I'm proud of you. Something like that. I was giving myself that self-talk. And also by that point, prior to that point, I'd never really thought about marriage or settling down because I thought, you know, my career and I have to do this. You know, I cannot afford to get into a relationship, to get married and do all of that because... I won't be a happy person if I don't have my career. Um, but after I cleared level two, I started to go out more, started to meet friends, you know, even thought about dating and it's okay to be in a relationship, you know? So, and, and I think at some level I wanted, I wanted, you know, to be in a relationship or to be married. So I started to think about that aspect of life a bit more than I did in the past. And then the same year I passed level two, I met my husband, my now husband. Um, and, you know, we started talking, getting to know each other. So obviously I got distracted. And um, so all of that coupled together um, was a recipe for not passing level three. <laughs> right. Now we get to this uh, very fascinating, how do you say change in career, in location, everything, right? I mean, you got married in Dubai and then emigrated to the US, to Oklahoma City of all places. Right? Then what happened was stunning because with zero experience in investments and with zero work experience in the US, you, a young Pakistani woman, was hired by an established wealth management firm as portfolio management associate. I've got two questions here for you. First question, how do you finally get an interview? Um, okay, so networking uh, really was the main, I would say if I were to narrow it down to just one, one reason and one big reason, it was networking. And, um, you know, I had applied for jobs online and never really heard back. And I had applied for the same job that I have now on LinkedIn or on like on online platforms and I never got a response. So I heard about, there's a local CFA society and they, you know, they were having an event. So, you know, in, in the past I had not gone for those events thinking that you know, I don't have a job. I don't want to go there and everybody has a job and I don't have one. So I just, I didn't have the confidence to go. But for one of the luncheons, I did go. And over there, I met, um, being in Oklahoma City, the society was fairly small. So I think at that luncheon, there were maybe 30 people. So a good opportunity to network and really, you know, getting a chance to talk to almost everybody there. So at that luncheon, I met a lady who she was in her, I would say, mid-management career at a very, very, you know, huge bank in Oklahoma City. Um, and she me and her were the only ladies over there. So we got talking and she asked me, you know, what my plan is, what I was doing. So I told her some of my background and for whatever reason, she was very, very helpful. And I think, I mean, it's because she's a genuinely, genuinely a very good person, very helpful person. She's gone through a similar journey when, when she was new to Oklahoma City as she is from East European uh, origin and not originally from the US or Oklahoma City. So she knew the difficulties an expat or somebody who's not from here can face in the job market. So she told me that, you know, um, just 
for, she asked me to send her my resume and she tried at her bank um, and she tried at some other places. And they said that, you know, since I don't have any U.S. experience, um, you know, it's going to be very difficult. So I did not get the job. But then she also introduced me to some of the folks at my current company. And, um, you know, we got talking and they they liked or, they, you know, they, they liked the small conversation that we had. And I got a call back, um, you know, for an associate portfolio manager position, the same position that I had applied for online a few months ago and never got a call back. So I would say that just having that personal connection, meeting folks face-to-face, -face, networking um, really goes a long way. I was never a proponent of networking as I'm, I'm very shy, introverted, um, you know, just um, a very sensitive, shy person. And I, it, networking was always very overwhelming for me. But after what happened in Oklahoma City, I'm a huge, huge pro proponent of networking. And I would say that um, that is the biggest reason why I got the job without having any U.S. experience or actually any wealth management experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if, if there's ever a testimonial uh, uh, in favor of uh, networking, this should be it. <laughs> you know what I just said now. The last yeah. Few minutes. And I mean, people think that networking, you know, you have to put up a show or it's just about telling people about yourself, being interested in what they have to say and learning about other people. You know, it's, so it's just just be yourself and just you, you'll connect with the people that, mm -hmm. um, you know, resonate with you. Yeah. So now, of course, you told me about the networking part, but I mean, why? Still, I don't understand why did they hire you despite your lack of credentials or qualifications or experience? I mean, you just came from the UAE, completely new to the US. So why? I would say that one reason was um, CFA did play a huge role because by that point I had passed level three. I was not a charter holder, but I had passed level three. Um, there were not a lot of folks that were you know, applying for that associate portfolio manager position that had either the charter or were uh, on the way to become charter holders. Mm -hmm. They had received some applications for, from level one candidates or level two maybe, but none of them had passed level three. So I think that was one uh, differentiating factor. The other one was um, there are not a lot of women CFA charter holders. So I think that played some role, you know, it, everybody wants diversity. Everybody wants that, you know, their investment team is not just made up of um, all men, you know, it should be a good mix so that their, you know, ideas can flow and there is some diversity of thought as well. So that would have been another reason. Um, and then I would say the biggest reason, and I talked to, um, even after I got hired, I talked to the president after as to, you know, why, why me and why not the other probably, you know, very, very well qualified, if not qualified, at least ones that had good experience, relevant experience. Why weren't, you know, why was I hired over them? Um, and the answer I got was that they saw that I was, I would be a good cultural fit in the organization. And also um, my soft skills or my communication skills uh, stood out amongst others, because some of the some of the analytical skills or some of the job related skills can be learned on the job. Um, but, you know, having a good base of soft skills or how you communicate or how you listen or how you articulate an idea is, is very important, you know, and those are the skills that are a bit more difficult to teach or take longer to teach or learn. So that, uh, th that stood out. Um, and mm -hmm. I would say that, yeah. So that was uh, one of the big factors. Right. I'm actually impressed by the part about you being selected because of the soft skills and confidence, uh, having known you for quite some time now. But that's the point that we'll come back to in a, in a later question in this podcast. Uh, meanwhile, let's talk about your career progression, right? Because the pace of your career progress did not end or slow there. Uh, because lo and behold, you got another career break in the same firm a few months later when you were promoted to portfolio manager. 
with barely what a uh, three months experience working uh, before that as mainly as an admin assistant. So you now had the exciting role of actually managing the portfolio of a few clients. So you quickly went from back office functionary to trusted client facing advisor, managing the large uh, multi-asset portfolio of multimillionaires. How the hell did that happen? Especially since you were so inexperienced and you told me they could have easily, for example, got talent from other branches of this same big company. Yeah. So I was hired as an associate portfolio manager and there were two other portfolio managers in the Oklahoma City office. So my job basically entailed supporting and helping the portfolio managers do their job. So you're right, like I was doing a lot of the back office stuff. I would sit in a few client meetings, but not as the primary portfolio manager that would do the presentation. I would sit in just to observe and learn. Um, and then I think in my first three months, I probably got two or three meetings uh, to sit on where I was the one presenting. And that was predominantly because the other portfolio managers were offsite or they were traveling for a client meeting or, you know, they had other uh, more pressing um, needs that came up. So I did get some exposure client facing and then within the first couple of months or two and a half months, the two portfolio managers, they got other better positions uh, that were offered to them and they took those job offers. And it just so happened that both of them left within a week of each other. And um, so from having two P portfolio managers, we're down to zero portfolio manager and just one associate. Um, so yes, that was, um, that was a difficult time. Just because, you know, uh, it's it's not, it takes a little bit of time to hire a portfolio manager and to see that, you know, if he or she would be good for the organization or not. But I will say that uh, the credit here really goes to um, the, the head of investments and the management of my company because they did put a lot of trust in me. And they told me that, you know, we are hiring a portfolio manager it will take a portfolio manager or a senior portfolio manager, whoever, but it will take time. In the meanwhile, you are the one that will be handling most of, you, you'll have support from other offices, but you're gonna be the one who's going to be leading or handling most of the portfolio management duties, whether it's trading, whether it's asset allocation, client meetings, doing performance reports, you'll do it if you think that there is a need to call in somebody else from another office because you know, a client may be too difficult to handle or it's, it's a very complicated account, then yes, we'll send in resources, uh, but we'll lean on you. So, you know, they gave me the, that, that really gave me the confidence and the, um, a lot of responsibility on my shoulders to the point that I would be thinking that, you know, yes, I cannot mess this up. And even at that point, I thought that it's a difficult time, but this is my, I mean, this is the opportunity what, that I was waiting for. You know, if, if, I can, if I can do this right, then my career path can look, you know, it can accelerate quite quickly. Um, so yes, and I always say that change is good. There is a lot of learning and a lot of, um, evolution that happens because of change. So even in that moment where I would say, I would say kind of like in the middle of the storm, even in the middle of the storm, I was, I was more excited than nervous. I was excited that, you know, this is my, I wouldn't have become a portfolio manager if this would not have happened because after that happened and after, um, you know, um, after a three, three or four months more when they hired a senior portfolio manager, even at that point, um, you know, the book of business was split between us because I was promoted to a portfolio manager because I had done a good job and they were happy with how I was serving clients and how I was, you know, presenting and doing my work. So, so yes, had, the, had those changes not happened, um, you know, it may have been another two years or so before I was promoted to a portfolio manager. So change is good. 
Right. Now, I love to compare and contrast cultures, especially work cultures, right? And you have now worked in at least two very contrasting cultures from what you told me uh, in, the, in the Middle East and the US. Now, you told me in an earlier conversation that after living in the UAE for so long, and also traveling to bigger cities in the US like New York, the culture in Oklahoma City, both at work and outside work, struck you as highly unusual, yet you connected with it as never before. So I've got three questions here. What are the three or what are the key elements of the culture uh, in Oklahoma that were remarkable? Um, okay, Oklahoma City is, I had, I did not know what Oklahoma City would be like when I came here. Um, but it's the people that make the city. So I will say that the people in Oklahoma City are, um, you know, some of the key qualities or some of the key elements of the community, I would say is uh, they're very, very, very humble. Um, very humble, you know, to the point where um, there is quite a bit of wealth in Oklahoma City and in Oklahoma in general, and a lot of it is generational wealth. Um, there is also new wealth there, um, or a wealth that may be one generation old. But every, I mean, I've met a lot of wealthy people through my work because you know we do cater to high net worth individuals and families. But I would say ninety nine percent of them are so down to earth, so humble that. You know, if I saw them at a grocery store or somewhere else, I would not think that this person has a multi-million dollar portfolio. Mm. So that was uh, quite a contrast from Dubai. Um, I would also say that they're very, very uh, culture and family oriented, which is similar to how our South Asian culture mm. is. So that was a little close to home. Um, you know, they they like to stay close to their parents. They like to, um, you know, have bigger families and be uh, the kids and be around their kids and their grandkids. So yes, that family, um, uh, strong cultural bonds are there. Um, even like there's an example where the CEO of our company, it was my first Thanksgiving after I started work and the CEO of the company asked me if, uh, you know, if my knee and my husband had any plans. And I just told him that, you know, we don't have any family around. Um, so we're just, gonna order in or go watch a movie or something like that and then to my surprise uh, he invited me and my husband over to his place for a Thanksgiving feast I would say uh, and we got to spend Thanksgiving with his family his cousins uh, other relatives and neighbors so you know that's um, that's a testament to how welcoming and how genuinely nice um, you know people are there um, and yes, my third point is that they're very, very helpful, um, extremely warm, extremely welcoming. Uh, and, you know, from the lady that helped me network and get a job to my CEO who invited me for a Thanksgiving meal and to all of my coworkers who have been phenomenal um, and all of the other friends I met through um, some of the nonprofit groups and some of the networking groups have been exceptional. So it's great people. Um, very down to earth, very humble, very kind. So, uh, and you see that in Dubai as well, but it's just that Dubai is a more fast paced city. So you don't see it as much as right. I saw it in Oklahoma City. So, so that was my next question. Uh, how does the experience that you had in, or in Oklahoma City, how does that contrast with what you experienced or saw happening at work in the UAE? Um, I would say, uh, Management or leadership style is one. Uh, a lot of the leaders that I saw in Oklahoma City, whether they were community leaders or whether you know leaders are in the corporate on the corporate side, uh, they do believe in servant leadership, and um, so it's more inclusive and it's more people focused than being corporate focused. So um, that that's a bit different. That's a little different from what. I'm sure there is servant leadership in UAE as well, but from what I've seen, it's, um, you know, I, I saw more of it in Oklahoma City. So that was one. Um, and even in Dubai, um, you know, because it's a more, I would say, cutthroat work environment, um, your 
uh, status in Dubai or living in Dubai as an expat is very, very much dependent on the kind of job you do and, you know, your work visa and all of that. So I understand why the aggressiveness is there, um, yet it's there. And it makes the work culture a little bit toxic as well, especially if you're lower down in the food chain. Um, so yes, if you're management level and it's all good, but a lot of the, um, I would say a lot of the, the aggressiveness, you know, um, people lower down uh, in the, um, on, on the corporate ladder get to experience the, that. And then I also saw, you know, some of the folks in management that, that would, um, that would maybe just, um, you know, not treat their employees as nice as they should because they were too focused on uh, their own work or just um, uh, just making it good with their own bosses or, you know, just maybe blaming their subordinates for a job that was not done. So just, it wasn't a very healthy work environment that I saw in Dubai. Um, and for whatever reason, I mean, there could be multitude of reasons, but Oklahoma City was a bit more people oriented, more holistic, less materialistic as well, I would say. Um, in Dubai, I saw even my coworkers or some of, some of the other folks were talking about a fancy car that somebody would be driving. And those things don't matter. You know, those things are not the work discussions that you should be happening, that, that you should be having. So more holistic, slower paced, um, servant leadership, you know, those are the differentiating factors that I saw work-wise in Oklahoma City versus in Dubai. Hmm. Interesting, because I'm always, uh, I've never worked in the US or, or, or in Europe, so I'm always uh, curious about what people's opinions are when they work in multiple cultures, and I'm sure it's not the same experience, but I'm, I'm keen to know what the differences are. Right, so now let's talk about your personal transformation, which is something that I have witnessed and I have been very curious about. I think the first time we had a proper conversation after the CFA classes, honestly, although we didn't have proper conversation during those classes, the first time we had a proper conversation was in probably mid Jan 20, 2022, as in last month, via Zoom. And I was quite taken aback, um, delighted, of course, by the latest version of, you know, the Saida Zainab Gardezi. And I had to regularly remind myself that I was talking to you. Because the last time I saw you as a student in my CFA prep class in Dubai, probably around 2015, you were a very different person. Yeah. I mean, you were painfully shy. You didn't engage at all. You never asked me anything, never answered any question. And then I suddenly I'm seeing this remarkably confident and articulate and self-aware person. So the first thing that pops into my mind when I see transformations like this, and I've seen quite a few, is that there must be a story behind it. People don't change us like that. So two very important questions for you. Number one, tell me if you can, why you were so withdrawn for so many years. And number two, more crucially, what drove the big change that I can clearly see now? I think I was always a very shy, introverted, um, sensitive person. So being withdrawn or not being the one asking questions in class was, it came very naturally to me. Um, I would actually need to go out of my comfort zone to do any kind of public speaking and, you know, to, to do any of that. So, so yes, so shyness is in my nature, I would say. And it's very normal for me to, you know, just sit and read or just do my own thinking and let others ask the questions and I just listen and learn from them, you know? So that comes very naturally to me. And I think my mom is that way also. So some of it is um, a bit genetic probably. Um, however, the big change that you say that has happened that now I'm, you know, I'm not anxious or I'm not nervous when I, when I talk to mm. strangers or when I do public speaking or when I talk to, you know, mm. um, when I talk on a platform like this, so um, 
I would say just getting the opportunity to exercise those public speaking and confidence muscles was what drove the change. Because even back in Dubai, or even when I was in college, um, I realized that this lack of confidence or this, um, you know, this um, not being articulate enough or not being able to, um, you know, voice my thoughts on a public platform, um, not being able to do that. Because even, you know, back in college, whenever we would have public speaking or as a project presentation or something, I would get extremely nervous and I would ask somebody else to do it or I would freeze or, you know, it was, it was extreme. So at that point, I realized, you know, that this will come in the way of my professional career growth. Um, so, so I had the recognition, you know, back when I was in your class or back when I was in college, but I did not do much about it. Um, you know, I, I should have been the one in class at least asking some questions so that that would, you know, give me that that was a good platform. I could have exercised my <laughs> confidence muscle back then. But it was only after I came to Oklahoma City, it was a new place for me. Um, I had to go out and meet people and network. And then I got a job, which almost 50% of that job as an associate PM, portfolio manager, and then as a portfolio manager, revolves around doing presentations, talking to different clients, which can range from families to individuals to bank boards to um, nonprofit boards, you know, anything and everything. Uh, so a multitude of client base. So, um, so yes, getting that opportunity to do that, um, you know, that's what I would say brought the change because in the beginning I was probably not as good, mm. um, but over time I did work on it and I did realize that the more I do it, the better I will get. And there's no other way. There is no amount of books I can read that will make me a good public speaker. Um, so yes, so getting that opportunity through work, being in a new environment where I was kind of forced to do it. Um, I had lived in Dubai for 16 years. So Dubai, I was a bit more uh, at ease. And then also um, I, got, I got involved in some community work being in Oklahoma City. I got involved in some women, um, some women-centric nonprofit organizations. And there was also an arts organization that I was uh, a treasurer of. And being a treasurer, I had to give um, quarterly uh, financial reports to the board. So that was another opportunity where I would, uh, I would get to flex my public speaking confidence muscle. And, and it's a muscle, you know, the more you work on it, the better it gets. The more you ask for feedback, the more you'll know. And that's what I did. I would always ask for feedback from folks that were in the meeting to ask them, you know, was I too fast or was I too slow? Did I lose the audience? Um, you know, where can I improve? So I would genuinely, it wasn't like, it wasn't a tactic on my end. I was genuinely, genuinely hungry for feedback because I had never done that before. So I did not know if I was doing a good job or, you know, I was just screwing it up. Um, so yes, feedback and then receiving genuine feedback. And sometimes I would ask specific questions, you know, did I do this part correctly or, you know, uh, did I answer that question from the client or not? So asking those specific questions and then genuinely, genuinely focusing on the feedback and then working on it. Um, mm -hmm. I would say brought, um, I mean, the change compounded, but it was small and gradual change after I moved here. Yeah, well, all I can say is a brilliant job <laughs> because uh, <laughs> it's just, a, I think, uh, at the least a testament to how focus and determination can really turn one's personality around despite what you may have been earlier, which your case was an introvert. I'm sure you're still substantially introvert, but I think you, can, you have now learned to rise to the occasion and grab opportunities. So that's, that's fantastic. Yes, yeah. My, my next question is related to culture, which is something again, I keep coming back to whether it is um, office culture or, or national culture or uh, something. Now, what is fascinating is that you bloomed in Oklahoma City, outside work as well, like you mentioned, and found time to get involved in a few nonprofits, including one related to women's empowerment. So it turns out we have something else in common. 
apart from the CFA program. Because the last mentioned, i.e. women's empowerment, is a topic that, as you probably know, connects with me for many reasons and drives me nuts as well for many reasons. Not the least being the way millions of women are treated in deeply conservative, perversively sexist, highly patriarchal societies like India and Pakistan. So I know you mentioned about your dad and how he encouraged you earlier, but I want to hear more details of how come you didn't go the other way and end up as a bland, quiet and compliant housewife with many kids in tow. I would say that, uh, like you say, you know, people are a product of their upbringing and environment, you know, upbringing being the most predominant factor. Um, so I would say that even though the Pakistani Indian, and we all know it, there's no hiding it or anything, no tiptoeing around it. Indian Pakistani society as a whole, you know, there yeah. are families that may be different, but yeah. as a whole, the society is heavily, heavily patriarchal. And there is a lot of focus on women just getting married. And there is not enough focus on women getting educated or heavens forbid, having a career. So, um, so I would say that growing up in that culture, there's no running away from it. There is no way that my parents could have sheltered me completely and withdrawn me from all of those opinions. And, you know, not, it's, it's, it's just, it just does not happen. And even after moving to Dubai, the, the cultural roots or the cultural impact that we get from or what we see in Indian Pakistani households may be slightly different, but still that undertone, patriarchal undertone is still there. Um, so I would say the biggest reason is um, that my parents provided me with some counter narrative that I, at least even though my mom was a housewife, so it was not that I saw my mom working and I aspired to be that way. It was just that my parents provided, gave enough importance to my education as well as my brother's education that I grew up with some equality mindset. And also I grew up with, um, you know, with my dad even saying stuff like you should always work, earn your own money. Um, and I mean, dads don't say that, at least Pakistani Indian dads. And so I grew up with that mindset that, you know, being a very sensitive, impressionable kid, I grew up with that mindset that, you know, um, that's what I'm going to do. I will have a career and I will have a career that will be important. It's not going to be just a time filler or something for me. It's, 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 it's important for me. So I need to focus on it. Um, so yes, I will say that upbringing played a huge role mm -hmm. and had my upbringing been different, um, then, you know, my life, uh, would have transpired in a much different way. I would have, I may have been just a timid housewife or just, you know, somebody who does not have a career and somebody who did not get to fulfill her aspirations or wishes and is probably unhappy about it. Um, hmm. Yeah, so nothing wrong with being a housewife as long as it's your own decision. Um, and a lot of times in our culture, it's not, you know, it's a decision that is imposed on you mm -hmm. or it's a decision that because of a lack of options given to you, this is what you end up doing. Uh, so yes, upbringing, uh, I would say is one. And then even uh, having a partner or having a spouse that cares about or that supports and encourages, you know, my career progression and my career path. So, you know, we don't get to choose our parents, but we sort of get to choose our spouses or we should get to choose our spouses. Even in arranged marriages, you have some choice. It's not, you know, it's not imposed on you. So you do have um, some say in it. So yes, having a partner uh, that, you know, is encouraging and does, you know, because my current job also involves travel. So he does step up and take charge when I'm not around. Um, so yes, having that support system is very important. We know the society is patriarchal. It's not going to change overnight. And we know that, you know, there is not enough importance given to women education. So 
whatever pockets of support as women that we can find in our society is extremely, extremely helpful. If you're not getting it from your parents, please focus on, if you want to get married, then please focus on finding somebody that will not support, but actually uplift you and encourage you to do more with your education and to mo do more with your career. Mm. Um, so yes, uh, sadly, I, I mean, even I would say in the last few years or so, I have not seen a lot of progression as a society. If anything, we're probably going backwards. So there's all the more pressure on the women to just, you know, to just do whatever they can and wherever they get the opportunity to do so. And lean into your, I would say, lean into that anger and aggression that we have as women living in a patriarchal society. There's no, there's no reason to hide it. Um, there's no reason to hide your passion. Um, you know, so, so just focus more inward and focus on what you want your life to look like. Um, and, you know, just take away, uh, just take some focus away from marriage because the society puts a lot of pressure on marriage and that can wait. Just focus on your career first and marriage is a part of life that may happen or may not happen, but it'll happen. If you want it to happen, it'll happen for you, but focus on your career first because that cannot wait. Hmm. And as time passes, it becomes even more difficult to do. So, you know, after you get married, you may have kids or not, then, it's not possible to build a career at that point uh, or it becomes very, very difficult. No, I, I hear you on that last point uh, very strongly because quite a few of my former CFA students, women, have, for whatever reason, put their career on hold by getting married and having kids. And that has had consequences, um, negative consequences not sure whether they were okay with the trade-off, but like you said, it's difficult to start a career after you started a family. And I suppose yeah. priorities and objectives have to be very clear earlier on. Uh, and even if you do have career objectives, like you said, have someone supportive in your life. Now, I want to talk about something very personal, uh, Saida, and yet, quite important to many listeners of this podcast. And I'm so glad really that you're ready to talk about it. And this is the issue of um, mental health and depression. Now you told me, uh, you were kind enough to share with me that you suffered postpartum depression for a while after the birth of your son, Nile. I've got quite a few uh, <clears throat> important questions here. First was, how does this depression manifest itself so that people can understand signs of this and pick up on it? For me, it was um, being very mentally and physically drained. And you would expect that after giving birth and, you know, having this huge change in your life, you would be physically drained. But it was more than that. You know, it was, it was not the physical exhaustion that you would expect your body to go through. Um, if you've had a tough day or, you know, you were working mm -hmm. nonstop or whatnot. It was more than that. Um, and I could even at that point tell that it is the, it is the, um, the, the mental or psychological drain that's impacting me physically. So, so that was one, you know, just having mental exhaustion. Um, and then also becoming more withdrawn, um, you know, I am introverted, but I do like my social life. I do like to go see my friends and, you know, have a heart to heart with them. But at that point, I did not want to talk to a lot of people, probably did not want to talk to anybody and um, just did not want to have a conversation. Um, so I would say that, yes, being mentally drained and just being very, very withdrawn, uh, being very short tempered, being very agitated, being very reactive were the uh, were the symptoms initially right now of course you are mostly free of depression and that's that's fantastic how exactly do you deal with it um you know in the first six months or so 
I just thought it's a phase, you know, it'll pass. So I thought I'll manage it. But then um, usually, you know, these kind of uh, depression or, you know, something like that, it not always, but a lot of times it can come because of change. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why women go through postpartum depression, because a huge change has happened in their life. Hmm. Um, and then apart from the hormonal changes going on in their body. So, so then, you know, um, at that point, another change was happening in my life where I was moving from Oklahoma City to Houston, um, because my husband got another job. So I was, you know, moving to Houston in the middle of COVID. And then I would have to work remotely. Uh, because our, my company did not have a Houston office. So, you know, they were kind enough to say that I could just work remotely. And right after the move, COVID started, basically. Um, so, so yes, at that point, that change aggravated the depression. And now, you know, there was some level of anxiety as well, which at the time I did not know. Um, I, I mean, at that point, I did not even know what anxiety is. It was only after I started talking to my therapist that she explained that, yes, you know, you, you're having a depressive phase, but couple that with anxiety as well, which is making it worse. So yes, you know, after the move to Houston, so this was probably after having six, seven months of being depressed or going through postpartum depression. Uh, that was the point where, um, you know, I decided that I need, I need external help. Um, and that was because, um, you know, I could only do I was still mentally, physically uh, exhausted. I could only do the bare minimum. I could do my job and I could take care of my kid, but anything other than that, exercising, going out, I could not, uh, I did not want to. I would just sleep as much as I, as, as much chance as I got. Um, so I realized that that's not, th that's not sustainable. You know, something has to change. If it hasn't changed in six, seven months, then let's just talk to somebody. Um, and then my husband, again, he was super supportive. He kept pushing me that, you know, just talk to somebody and we need to talk to a professional. So that's when I started to reach out and look at um, therapists in the area that had expertise in postpartum. And I found a really nice, uh, really nice therapist to talk to. So, yes, that helped. Um, but then also I was doing a lot of stuff on my own uh, as well, reading, reading up about it, um, you know, just trying to understand it more and how I can, how I can not make it worse. Uh, so yes, I was doing a lot of that on the side as well, along with talking to, talking to a professional probably like twice a month. Hmm. Yeah. Now, now one of the issues that someone with mental health problems goes through apart from the mental health problem itself is how other people, how society perceives mental health issues like anxiety and depression, which probably makes the situation worse. What in your view are the few key things that most normal people don't get about depression that they should understand? I think one of the biggest things is uh, people say, and this is these, the two points that I will say will always come from folks that have zero experience with any kind of mental, health issue. Mm -hmm. um, people will say that uh, people will equate being sad with being depressed. And both of those things cannot be, you know, more opposite from each other. Um, being sad is just, you know, an emotional state you go through. So if my friend is leaving town, or if my, you know, if my friend is leaving town, then I'll, I'll be sad about it. But I will not be depressed. Um, depression there, there's no one-to-one -one correlation between being depressed and there being a reason for it. A lot of times the reasons are, um, there's, there are a multitude of reasons. So you cannot pinpoint that I am depressed because X, Y, Z. And if you fix X, Y, Z, then I'm okay. Um, so yes, being sad and being depressed are two different things. Um, Depression can come from multitude of reasons, whether it's generational, whether it is, you know, some kind of trauma that you went through in your childhood and now it's surfacing in terms of emotions because you never dealt with it in the past. Uh, it can be environmental as well. And it can be all of those reasons combined. Um, so, yes. 
So we need to really bridge. And I would say the responsibility lies with people who go through any kind of a men mental health <coughs> issue and also um, people who have not gone through it. So there has, there has to be, um, the gap has to be bridged. And people who have not gone through it need to read up on you know, some of the emotional health, holistic health books. And there's a lot of great books that I read that are out there. You know, So while I was going through it, I read some of, some of the good ones that stick out are How to Do the Work, um, The Highly Sensitive Person, Atomic Habits, Think Like a Monk, the body keeps the score and there's you know many others especially now there are even podcasts and tedx mm -hmm. uh, ted talks and all of that on depression so yes people who haven't gone through it please read up on it understand it better um before making any comments like this and then people who have gone through it don't need to be shy about it or they don't need to hide it just own it talk about it and it's okay you know things happen in life and this is just i mean that's what make makes life so vibrant and mm. amazing that you go through different phases in your life. And this was just one part of your life. It doesn't define you. So just talk about it, be open about it. Mm. And mm. then the other thing I would say is kind of linked to the previous one where people say, um, again, people have not gone through it would say this. They'll say things like just snap, just snap out of it or focus on the good and it'll be all better, you know, stuff like that. Um, and that kind of implies that being depressed is a choice. And if the person who is depressed makes a different choice, then he or she will become better somehow. Um, so yes, I mean, you know, refrain from making such comments because nobody wants to be depressed. It's not a choice. Yes, there are multitude of reasons underlying it, and those reasons need to be looked at. And, you know, it's just probably your body and your mind's way of telling you that you've neglected me. Now just focus on it. Hmm. Now, of course, you know that mental health issues such as depression uh, are spreading fast, especially among the young and especially during this you know, tough pandemic times. And I've noticed that because a lot of youngsters reach out to me on LinkedIn email and, and share stories of their mental health issues, which is, I mean, those not only destroys happiness, but it's such a tragic waste of potential. What will you advise young people who are suffering from depression uh, to do? Okay, so I totally hear you there. I mean, um, there are a lot of young people, especially in, it's a different time now versus when I was young. So, you know, social media wasn't, and even having, I did not have a cell phone up until I was in 11th grade or something. So yes, it's a different world. Um, mental health issues, especially after COVID have become very, very common. And uh, it is a lack of, uh, it, it is a, um, you're wasting potential if you're spending time being depressed and not working on it. So I would say from my experience, what helped me and what I would recommend really from experience, young people or just anyone who is go, going through uh, similar symptoms or going through depression would be to um, read. One would be read, you know, just read up on it, listen to audiobooks or listen to podcasts. Um, now, post COVID, there is so much content on YouTube. Um, one, it will not make you feel alone. Uh, you will feel that you know these thoughts or these emotions that I'm feeling are other people have gone through similar or much worse. Um, so there is no um, th there is no reason to be shy about it, or there's no reason to um, you know not um, to feel reclusive just because mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. uh, feelings that you're having. So yes read up on it, uh, listen to these audiobooks, and it will also help you understand your emotions a little better. It will help you understand that you are different from your emotions or you are not your emotions, essentially. Um, you know, um, you can, instead of, like even me, when I'm talking to myself and if I'm feeling angry, rather than saying I am angry, you know, I... I tell myself that I'm feeling angry. So, you know, you are feeling your emotion or your feeling. You are not defined 
uh, or your personality is not defined by your emotion. And that kind of makes you think that emotions or feelings are more transitory in nature and they'll come and they'll pass and they don't have to stay with you forever. Um, so yes, that comes with uh, just, um, you know, reading up on mental health and your emotional state a bit more. And then I would also say that uh, writing helps. So um, anybody, especially who's going through postpartum, uh, you know, you do get some depressive phases where there would be moments in your day or in your week where you feel extremely, extremely low and you don't feel like doing anything. Um, you know, you, you may just be having a lot of depressive thoughts. So at that point, rather than just, um, you know, rather than just engaging with your thoughts just in your head, it's good to engage with your thoughts on paper. So write it down. Um, because that writing helps you explore those thoughts and those emotions more. And it helps you even uh, come back to it later and read it. Um, and then even after, you know, once you've made some progress, even after a few months or a year or so, you can come back and see, you know, what state of mind you were in and how much progress you've made. Um, also, you know, if you're seeking external help, then writing helps because um, it helps you explain the state you were in to your uh, psychologist or therapist a lot better. And just writing, it helps you understand yourself more. So it's good to write. Um, so just make use of, you know, if you're going through a depressive phase or if there's a moment in time where you're feeling extremely low, just make, make good use of it and write. And then um, this one is a little difficult to do, but once you start working on, um, on your journey with coping with depression or postpartum depression, mm -hmm. at some point it is good to start giving your life more structure. You know, have some things in your day that you do regardless. Um, and that, you know, make, me, make you connect with yourself a bit more. So for me, it was, you know, once I, once I started working on it and then, you know, I started having, uh, I was less drained physically and mentally. So then I got the energy to even go out and exercise, go to the gym. So for me, really going to the gym, exercising, um, going for a walk was very therapeutic and very helpful. Um, reading was very good for me. Uh, so I would do those things. So that provided some structure in my life. I know for some people it could be yoga meditation, cooking is therapeutic, you know, trying out a new recipe. So just um, try to add more structure with your life once you, to your life, once you start working on it, uh, working on your depression journey. Um, and then also um, don't be rigid. You know, I know there are some people who are against medication and some who are pro mm -hmm. and just be open to any and all solution. And recognize that depression is caused by a multitude of reasons. Therefore, the, the way to deal with it or the way to, in a way, cure it would also have to come from, or the solution will need to come from a multitude of sources. Um, you know, you can start trying to work on it yourself. And then if that doesn't help, then, you know, start talking to a professional. And then once you start talking to a professional, if you don't notice any change, then be open to, you know, if there is any kind of medication that that professional will recommend. So just don't be rigid because everyone's depression and their postpartum depression looks different. So, um, you know, just start with yourself, start by yourself, um, go to a therapist and then, you know, just talk therapy is very helpful. So do that for a while. And then you will be, you will have the mental clarity to, you know, make the decision with your therapist of whether or not, you know, you need some kind of external help because a lot of um, sometimes depression can be generational mm -hmm. and it takes a long time to work on those issues. So while you're working on those issues, you may need some external help. Um, postpartum is, you know, it's, it's slightly easier, I would say, to deal with versus, you know, if you've had a lot of trauma in the past. Wow, Saida, that's been uh, quite educational for me. I mean, uh, you know, I, I've interviewed lots of guests and I can't recall the last time 
have learned so much from the guest because you have lived through the experience of depression and not only that i think you have very clearly and concisely and comprehensively talked about the causes some very interesting causes i never thought about like change could cause depression the causes the symptoms of depression the treatment of depression um especially i like you mentioned about reading and writing and giving some structure to your life um so i think this has been a very uh, because i was like most lay people quite ignorant about mental health and had a very superficial understanding and that was reflected in my behavior towards those who had mental health issues like most of the population on this earth i, su I suspect but this has been quite informative and educational for me so thank you for going to depth uh by answering those four questions of mine and i'm sure and i hope listeners can gain a lot uh by by this uh, virtual mentorship on how to tackle mental illness uh time flies and now we are in our last question so <laughs> Oh, wow. I, yeah, I know. Uh, like they say, time flies when you're having fun, right? And uh, so based on your experience, Saida, what are the top three tips you would give to someone who is about to enter or is already in the earlier years at the workplace? I would talk from my experience and mm -hmm. what mistakes I made that I could have done differently. Um, but there was one thing that was always in me, you know, the drive. Hmm. So, which I don't see a lot of now in the young people at work. So I will say that that would be number one, like have a can do, can do, can do attitude about work. Um, just take on whatever hmm. is being given to you and be hungry for more do as much work as you can um, to the point where people think that if I give some task or some project to this guy or gal, he or she can do it. Hmm. And I know it will be done on time because this person is very proactive, very active and gets it done. Um, and, you know, in the process, you'll ask more questions, just be more inquisitive. So have that attitude. Don't wait for things to come to you. You know, if you're a new person at work and they're not giving you a lot of tasks because they don't know if you're going to do a good job or not, just go ask, you know, go to a different department, ask what you can do to help, whether you're an intern or new new person. So do that if you're a complete newbie. Um, and then I will also say that this was an advice actually given to me um, fairly recently by a very, very experienced person in my organization. So she said that, you know, this is one advice that she would give to a lot of her, um, you know, mentees that become a subject matter expert in something related to your job. So that may not be applicable to somebody who's in their maybe first year of starting mm. their first job. Mm. But you know, in your first three years, I would say, try and become a subject matter expert in something related to your job. So with my job, um, you know, everybody on my investment committee team knows that if they need, if they need to talk about ESG investments or sustainable investment, they need to go to Saida. So, you know, that, that gives you a boost of confidence as well. And then that gives you that omnipresence in the organization where people know that, okay, if they want to talk about, you know, whichever thing related to your job, um, then they, you are the person that they will think of. So try and do that. Um, and then uh, I will say that the last one uh, would be to network. And that's very important, you know, network within the organization, network outside of the organization, be part of various communities that you can be part of, you know, even if it's not directly related to your job. Like for instance, when I was a treasurer at uh, an arts organization or an arts nonprofit organization in Oklahoma City, I mean, arts couldn't be more further from mm. what I did, but I got offered the position and I was like, there is no way I will say no to this because I have never done this. 
I've never been on the board of a nonprofit organization. And being a treasurer, I will get to know more about it. Um, you know, and I'll just get a chance to be involved. So yes, um, you know, sometimes an opportunity can come your way or just seek an opportunity that may not be related to your work, but then you'll get to meet, you know, some important folks in the community. You'll get to talk to different people. You'll get to talk to people outside of your um, industry or work. And that's very valuable. So yes, um, you know, in er early on in your career, just do a lot of networking, have a can-do attitude. Um, and become a subject matter expert. And I'll add another one, which I see young people do. So I'll just add that. And it would be, do not complain. Um, mm -hmm. You know, your job will not be ideal. Your work environment may not be ideal. Um, you know, the people, there will be issues, but the complaining hurts you more than anything else, because then that becomes your mental attitude. And that comes in the way it, uh, it hinders your productivity at work. So just try to find, you know, if, if you don't like your work environment, have the, have the thought in your mind that I will make the most of it, um, gain whatever I can from this, and then look for something else outside. But don't, don't be the one who sits with their friends and complains about their job. Hmm. Especially early on in your career, you know, maybe 30 years in, you would have had the experience to, you know, talk with some kind of a surety or some kind of, you know, um, uh, you would have reasons hmm. to complain hmm. or not, but early on in your, in your career, don't, don't be that person. No, I completely agree with you. I, I like that last point because no mentor, no boss wants to work with someone who is constantly complaining uh, about something, whether it's big or small. Uh, and that can get worse as they progress in their career uh, because it's a reflection of a personality trait probably. Yeah, like have a solution-based attitude. If you see something that's not working, you know, suggest a change hmm. or, you know, they may not implement the change, but for sure your boss or management will appreciate that at least this person came up with, hmm. um, you know, a potential solution. Brilliant. Uh, that, that's the perfect ending to what has been a perfect podcast interview, I must say. Uh, it's been a pleasure and a privilege, Isai, that to be, to have interviewed you but also thinking back, also quite a pleasure and a privilege to have been part of, although a tiny part of your journey of transformation uh, over the last, say, six or seven years. This interview has been so fascinating and insightful for me personally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, especially about the mental health and a few other issues. And I really want to thank you for being, for taking the time out to think about the answers to this not so easy questions as, as you may have noticed. <laughs> because I always like to get into depth uh, in my interviews. And so thank you for being the perfect guest in that respect. Thank you for taking the time and for being totally honest uh, about some very important issues that people rarely talk about, but they should. And I, I compliment you for that. I look forward to seeing your further career progress with uh, huge interest. <laughs> and I'm sure the best is yet to come. So thank you. Thank you, Binod. And I will say that um, I have learned a lot from you, uh, just being part of Genesis. And you were you know, one of uh, my mentors or teachers over there. Okay. And um, even though I was fairly shy and you know, fairly uh, not you know, engaging much, but passively on my side, um, you know, you may not know this, but you did teach me uh, a lot. Um, so thank you for that. And I'm glad we're in touch. And I would, you know, greatly appreciate the opportunity to stay in touch because I think you, you have a lot of wisdom. And, um, you know, what you say is very, very impactful, especially for, you know, on a personal side and also on you know, the, the professional or career side for folks like me or even folks that are very, very new uh, mm -hmm. in their career. So thank you. Thank you for being you. Uh, thank you for being brutally honest all the time. Um, and thank you for, you know, teaching us by example um, and also by your words uh, and wisdom. Thank you. Thanks, Aida.
podcast is brought to you by the real finance mentor thank you so much for listening and i really hope you found it insightful and inspirational if you did enjoy this episode please drop us a review and spread the word and be sure to check out more exclusive content on the realfinancementor.com and my linkedin profile which is binod shankar cfa let's keep in touch just add your name to the mailing list on the realfinancementor.com and we'll tell you about new episodes plus book reviews upcoming events and blogs till the next time onwards and upwards